Hi. Okay, we're continuing here on the uh, great discussion of mural weapons. Uh, starting in Chapter 3 now, we're going to go over uh, basically a general um, introduction, define the terminology of mural weapons, and uh, some brief points about how others have looked at mural weapons and stuff like that. Um, to begin with, to define uh, neuro weapons, um, there's a scholar named McRate, and he defines neuro weapons as the claim is made that neuro weaponry encompasses all forms of interlinked cybernetic, neurological, and, and advanced biotech systems, along with the use of synthetic biological formulations and merged physiobiological and chemical scientific arrangements designed expressly for offensive use against human beings. Neural weapons are intended to influence, direct, as in steering, to direct you in a certain pathway, weaken, suppress, or neutralize human thought, brainwave functions, perception, interpretation, and behaviors to the extent that the target of such weaponry is either temporarily or permanently disabled, mentally compromised, or unable to function normally. Um, some known examples of neuroweaponry being used, uh, say in the political world, we definitely know that they were used against um, Boris Yeltsin. Now, uh, I don't know how much people know about um, Soviet history and the transition to the, the Russian, uh, uh, what we know today as Russia, came out of the Soviet Union. There was a leader then, um, his name was Boris Yeltsin. And he was trying to, um, he's most famous for stopping a communist overthrow of his government by climbing onto tanks and drinking vodka with the, with the soldiers. And the soldiers reply, we would never shoot on our own people. Um, he was targeted by neuroweaponry to um, interfere with this transition to like the new state of Russia and transitioning to the, the Duma and the parliament and holding elections, which they hold in Russia all the time, just like they do here in America. But anyway, to continue on, um, with this, uh, just a brief note about what we define a battle space as. Um, just to give you a definition of battle space, the Department of Defense defines a battle space as the environment factors and conditions which must be understood to successfully apply combat power, protect the force, or complete the mission. This includes the air, land, sea, space, and the included enemy and friendly forces, facilities, weather, terrain, the electromagnetic spectrum and information environment within the operational areas and areas of, of interest. This is uh, as defined by the U.S. Department of Defense in 2011, which is also cited by McCrate in his work, which you'll find on the uh, online version of this chapter once I finally finish it and put the final version up there. Um, one thing to really note about neuroweapons is, like I previously mentioned, this is a highly covert world of the defense and intelligence world of, of, of major nations and many, many nations, really. Um, secrecy is like of the utmost importance to this, and you'll also, and not just secrecy, but also disinformation. But uh, one uh, academic scholar who has been studying this issue, he is a professor at the East Carolina University here in the United States. His name is um, Krishnan. Uh, he notes about this secrecy that a researcher of neural weapons not only has to deal with the issue that official information is unavailable, but furthermore, with the problem of outright disinformation. Steve Aftergood has pointed out that the Cold War secrecy systems, such as special access programs, authorizes defense contractors to employ cover stories to disguise their activities. 
The only condition is that the cover stories must be believable. So that gives you a pretty good uh, understanding of, you know, if you're trying to uh, figure out something like this, which is um, a very covert system, uh, but it also is not like a weapon you can see. It's not like somebody's walking down the street with a machine gun and is going to point it at you. You can see the machine gun. This is a, a highly um, um, cloaked, you might say, or stealth capability. This is like one of the most stealth capabilities because you, you're basically taking over people to use them as weapons against their own team or people or whatever group or thing you're you're trying to um, disassemble or polarize or for the purposes of taking them over, but through using persuasion that is not argumentation, it's outright control instead of, you know, like holding a discussion and coming to terms with things. Um, To further go into some of the things Krishnan talks about in his book called Neuroweapons, uh, it's, it was released in 2017. This is like one of the first uh, academic publications that even uh, touches the topic. Um, there have been other researchers such as um, James Giordano, who is known for giving uh, lectures about neuroweapons, but nobody's ever really gone over it comprehensively as much as Krishnan has. Uh, Krishna says this about neuro weapons, and specifically he's talking here about neuro warfare. In contrast, the kind of warfare that has been practiced by totalitarian regimes in the 20th century and that could be much refined by insights gained from neuroscience is following a completely different pattern for conducting hostilities. Neuro warfare is likely to extend over many decades with the distinction between peace and war becoming not just blurred, but meaningless. Neuro warfare primarily targets an adversary's minds and ultimately seeks to fundamentally alter the adversary's consciousness until the adversary perceives the world the same way as the sponsors of neuro warfare the aim is to cognitively assimilate other societies. Hostilities are carried out by proxies in a mostly covert, indirect manner and will generally not even amount to violence. Although this, this is not really true in our real world, as uh, my contention is that most uh, uh, Middle Eastern terrorism, for example, and I can state um, I can go into sample, uh, examples in Northern Ireland during the Troubles and give you similar examples of this. Um, violence is a very big part of neuro warfare from my studies. Uh, but anyway, much of it will be merely information warfare or propaganda in combination with other techniques of covert subversion, including espionage, sabotage, and the use of agents of influence. Populations and decision makers are the main targets in neuro warfare, and populations are also used as new weapons of mass destruction for destroying an enemy state through, through the calculated psychological instigation of internal chaos. No international rules exist or are observed in the new informational psychological combat. And that's from uh, Krishnan's 2017 uh, work, uh, page 193. Information warfare is the main motive behind neuroweaponry. Information warfare is applied to both individuals and to collective societies and groups, etc. So it's not surprising that the East German Stasi, who are the secret police of East Germany, kind of like the uh, Nazi Gestapo, except they changed symbols, and the Nazi Gestapo members in the East became uh, East German communist Stasi secret police. Um, you see this again and again, but... Uh, but anyway, I want to get into uh, this particular program of Stasi called Zersetzung, and to define what Zersetzung is, and 
So Satsang is an operational method of the Ministry for Security of State for the effective fight against subversive activities. With Zersetsong across different operational political activities, one gains influence over hostile and negative persons. In particular, these would be political dissidents within uh, this given society, specifically East Germany, um, with negative persons. In particular, over that which is hostile and negative in the dispositions and beliefs in such a way that there, will be sh there would be shaken off and changed little by little. And if applicable, the contradictions and differences between the hostile and negative forces would be, would be uh, provoked, exploited, and reinforced. The goal of Zersetsang is the fragmentation, paralysis, disorganization, and isolation of hostile and negative forces in order to impede thereby in a preventive, preventative manner, the hostile and negative doings to limit them in large part or to totally avert them, and if applicable, to prepare grounds for a political and ideological reestablishment. So here we, we previously I talked about um, uh, behavior control, behavior modification. Um, that's basically what the Zersetsang program was about. Uh, they would take uh, political dissidents and isolate them in prisons. And uh, for, ins for example, in East Berlin, this, you can go to East Berlin and you can take a walking tour of one of these prisons, which were used specifically to brainwash, which is what basically is that song is. It's taking people who don't agree with the official government policy here, totalitarian communism, and reprogramming them, brainwashing them to believe and support the totalitarian communist regime. Neuroweapons against individuals is a methodology employed for neutralizing covertly and usually non-lethally any dissident voices as a form of non-obvious warfare, according to Krishnan on page 184. Its use against individuals that pose no violent threat may seem surprising, but this is an interesting uh, example that Krishnan gives. Um, even though these people may not uh, believe in using force or violence to uh, back up their political will against uh, a totalitarian regime or any government that is um, any invading force, say, uh, against the United Kingdom in Northern Ireland to pacify the native Irish, for example. Uh, but it's interesting because Krishna notes here that in the 1980s in Great Britain, the British intelligence services used uh, this warfare against peace activists who uh, were at a U.S. military base protesting. And this is, uh, they complained about um, nausea, dizziness in their head, uh, impairment. The same exact symptoms that Boris Yeltsin was complaining about, but this is in the 1980s in Britain. Uh, Krishna notes on page 120, that uh, the British Defense Equipment Catalog once carried reference to the Valkyrie system and frequency weapons. These were eliminated from the catalog by the, the request of the British Ministry of Defense in 1983. So it's not just um, ostensibly you know, there's ostensibly totalitarian governments, and there are ostensibly democratic governments. Uh, but here is a case in so-called democratic Britain of using these weapons against what should be a protected right of citizens to voice their protected right of opposing something or being for something, and it can swat it will. You know, you can target people to oppose something, you can target people to be for something, et cetera, et cetera. So we will see some other examples, um, specifically from the conflict in Northern Ireland and how British uh, Britain has used psychological warfare in Northern Ireland, um, and further down the road, how they use computers to automate their psychological warfare. Uh, they claim not against Northern Ireland, and they say they only use this system in Bosnia, for example. 
but we d definitely know that they use the system in Northern Ireland. But anyway, to continue. Um, one last thing I, I'd like to get to in this section is the, that which I was just uh, mentioning, which is uh, artificial intelligence, uh, cybernetics. Um, cybernetics we'll get into in a, a later chapter. And, and a lot of the second half of the book, after this overview of like the historical development of neuro weapons, is uh, pretty technical and geeky, and we go into a lot of artificial intelligence. Uh, the use of cybernetics. Cybernetics is uh, basically using computers to control things, including people. Um, and here, um, one of the things that um, Krishnan goes into is how automation, and it's very alarming that they would use automation for neural warfare, but they are. But I just want to go through this here. Alarmingly, the latest developments in neural weaponry involves the use of automating the technology through artificial intelligence. To this point, Krishnan quotes Russian Major General Vasily Burenok, that's B-U-R-E-N-O-K, armed violence will assume a secondary position in the future as different forms and methods of ad adversely influencing a state, a society, or an individual will appear. Such developments include changing the technogenic shell of civilization making a distinction between living and non-living things uncertain. Here the real issue is cyber life, he notes. New gene combinations will be designed that do not currently exist, while nanobots will alter the characteristics of an organism. New conflicts will, in Burenok's opinion, not be so much wars between people as wars of artificial intellects and the equipment and virtual reality created by this kind of intellect. And that's on page 190 of Krishnan's work on neural weapons. Uh, Krishnan also remarks that biotechnology and nanotechnology could be employed for remaking human life and reshaping human civilization as a method of war. The Russian strategist also seems to believe that military decision-making will be largely delegated to artificial intelligence, turning warfare in a contest of competing military AI systems. So, that's rather ominous. Um, if neural weapons in and of itself, or psychological warfare in and of itself, isn't enough to scare the bejesus out of you, <laughs> Automating these things and using artificial intelligence to replace humans in warfare. I mean, um, you're opening a can of worms that can get really out of control. And, and we'll be going through this. Uh, we'll start looking at how these different ways using automation and cybernetics can lead to systems spinning out of control. And also we'll look at, you know, how systems, computer systems, are being used to basically reshape human thought on a mass scale using, uh, for example, uh, social networks such as Facebook or Twitter. Um, the, the, I guess I'd like to wrap up this section just by stating that um, in the next section, we're gonna be going over some of these, uh, no, uh, well actually the next section is, uh, is on Russian research from 1919 to 1945. Um, but during that period, the next section after that is on Nazi research, and we'll also be going into the ways where Nazis were doing genetic research and experimentation using uh, spreading um, viruses, uh, infecting viruses with bacteriophages. Uh, basically, the Nazis, the Germans, the Nazis were the creators of not just um, uh, biological warfare techniques, but also uh, they're one of the major innovators in computer warfare techniques, and we'll start going over all these different things in uh, these next few sections. <laughs>